please come with five minutes uh, of advance. Thank you very much. So today we're going to start with the uh, uh, with the real thing. So trying first in setting up the nomenclature and what do you mean when we talk about certain objects and notions that are widespread in uh, uh, in artificial intelligence and in reinforcement learning uh, in particular. So you can interrupt me at any time in order to ask questions. Uh, just please use the microphone so the recording will include your question. Otherwise, I have to repeat the question, and etc. This is for the sake of people who are not in measure of attending personally this set of lectures and might be interested in having a look at them on the on the web on our uh, channels. So, um, okay. Uh, so before starting, uh, I just wanted to uh, ask a general question. So who would be interested in having a sort of one hour, one hour 30 general discussion about uh, interactions between artificial intelligence and ethics and legal issues and uh, the future of work uh, and all the things? Please raise your hands. Okay, good enough. Uh, we can have this. Matteo, uh, we'll discuss together when there is a good time slot uh, over the week in order not to be too much uh, uh, pressing on you to you, yourself to study. Okay. So, um, so first things first, from the examples that we've been discussing yesterday, we've been seeing, there are some uh, distinctive features that emerge, right? So, one general idea that we cannot escape is the question, what is intelligence, right? Because we want to develop algorithms for artificial intelligence, for machines and algorithms that do things, see things, perceive, etc. So, we have to distill a notion of intelligence. And it's, it's, it's very difficult, right? So, that might be a very wide spectrum of definitions that you can adopt. We're not going to enter into this definition. The history of artificial intelligence, which actually started in the in between the 50s and 60s. So there is a beautiful book. Uh, okay, I, I will then provide you uh, the references for, for background material, but there's a beautiful book on the history of artificial intelligence that I suggest for you all to read. At the beginning, so at the beginnings of uh, the history of artificial intelligence, one notion of intelligence that was adopted was the ability of to perform logic reasoning. Okay, so making logic connectors and constructing out of logic, the ability of reasoning and doing intelligent things. That was a dead end, dead end road. Okay. If you want to draw a similarity, that would be just like try and understand the way this chalk splits in two, starting with quantum mechanics. Okay. You have to adopt a different level of description that is not just logic combination of things, because you don't go nowhere. You don't go anywhere. Right? It's just like, you might remember from the history of mathematics when Bertrand Russell wrote books as things like this, trying to derive the axioms of computing with integer numbers starting from logic, right? So it's a long path. It doesn't mean that it's, it's, a, it's not a worthwhile problem in mathematics and foundations, etc. It's just something that it doesn't work in practice. Okay? So you have to adopt a different level of description if you want to implement intelligence. So I'm asking to you. So let, let's have anyone wants to contribute with his own understanding of what intelligence is, what makes intelligence distinctive. Ability to yeah, probably press again because it's good. Click. Um, ability to uh, distinguish different scales and to order them different scales and to order them? And to, to do some hierarchical <laughs> inference. Okay, you've been very much biased recently <laughs> by recent experiences, okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm looking for definitions which would work for machines, animals, humans, right? So 
Okay, this is the definition about, about scales. Then do we have anything else here? Maybe the ability to gauge one own behavior based on the experience of the surrounding environment and the ability to make prediction based on that. Okay, good. So there are two different things here. So one is evaluating your own behavior, okay? So getting basically some feedback from the environment which says you're doing right, you're doing wrong, okay? To some degree, which might be a very complete feedback telling you, oh yeah, you've been doing exactly the right thing, except at that particular time you should have been doing this and etc. or a very loose feedback, like, like meh, okay. Uh, and then the other thing is perception, you said, right? Okay. Uh, yeah, just a second. It's quite similar to what you said in the sense that given also that there are several kinds of intelligences, the ability to perceive the environment, process it at some level, and then being able to use it to obtain a goal or to predict or to make predictions that are useful to adapt and adjust one's behavior, as for example in logical intelligence or artistic intelligence. Okay, yes, another keyword that comes up is adaptation, so the ability to react to change in condition in the environment, which is also crucial. <laughs> another contribution here. Well, in the same line that they are uh, talking, uh, find patterns in order to make predictions about the environment. Okay, find patterns. In this would mean, I think, that construct a representation of the environment which is useful, perhaps according to some predefined classes or not, that depends. Plus one, then we move on to summarize. I think intelligence is, uh, I give you the axioms of number theory, or sometimes I give you the axioms of algebraic geometry, and then out of them you can prove Fermat's class theorem. If you cannot do that, then it's just artificial. Okay, I don't quite agree with this last definition. This, this is more of the deductive intelligence. You start with axioms and then you're able to deduce the consequences. This is pretty much the thing that I was saying didn't really lead to any substantial improvement in practice, but that's one definition that has been adopted in the, in the past. And just uh, let's, let's try to distill all these ideas. Uh, so what the community of people working in artificial intelligence agrees upon is the following definition of intelligence. So first of all, let's try and identify. So you, you've been saying many of these things. We're just, just putting them in order. So first thing, there has to be, in order for an intelligence to be, there has to be an agent and an environment, which are two, two separate things. So the agent is the one that perceives acts, thinks, plans, and the environment is whatever is outside this agent, which might be the environment, that is uh, everything that is outside us, including other agents. Okay, so this is a very general definition, but this is key. So the basic idea is that there is an agent If you can't read from the back, tell me and I will just uh, increase my font, okay? There is an agent and this agent lives in an environment, okay? For the sake of purpose, I would draw another box, but of course, this environment is everything that is around the agent. Then what kind of exchanges are there between agent and environment? So one is perception. So the environment sends signals to the agent and these signals are called percepts and we will see later on what kind of things they are we will go more in the detail of this uh, how does the agent process the percepts through a set of sensors okay so there is an interface between the agent and the environment which i draw here which is made of sensors, okay? Anything that is able to perceive the environment. So in AlphaGo, what is it? It's just probably a camera on top of this that gets the current configuration and pass it on, right? Okay, it's able to segment and this, or even simpler, I don't know, there might be sensor on the chessboard which tells 
where each piece of is, uh, that, that's one simple interface. Uh, for robots, plenty of interfaces, visual, tactile, okay, so mechanical, some robots have uh, artificial noses in order to sense chemicals in the environment, okay, anything that is akin to our senses, the way that for, for humans, for animals, the senses are what uh, conveys information from the environment to the agent. And inside the, the agent, there is this box, which is might be the brain or the algorithm or the algorithms, the hardware that makes the, the calculation, etc. But after processing this information, the outcome is some action. Okay? So the agent does something. And in general, the result of this action changes the state of the agent with respect to the environment. It need not be always the case, right? But if we want to encompass this in the most general case, actions modify the environment. So for instance, in a task in which I am the agent and I have to go on the other side of the room, okay, I, what I do, I, I look around Okay, I see there's a step here, there's a desk there. I take a step, so sensory, motory. Okay, I took an action. My state with respect to the environment has changed. Because before I was, I don't know, one meter away from the corner of the desk, now I take a step and I'm just 10 centimeters away. So my relative position to the environment has changed. Okay, so this is the most general way of thinking about these things. And then this process goes on and on and on and on. It's a repeated interaction between the agent and the environment. So this is the most general definition of, so just, just one second, uh, the layer which transforms concepts, ideas in the brain or in the algorithm into real actions that produces motion, for example, is called the actuator. So how these things are done, the sensor and the actuator, is a matter of engineering for a robot or for a machine, etc. So we're not going to focus on how to do this and how to do that. This would be abstract processing units that transform information, transform the input into something that is managed by the algorithm and then the algorithm, again, outputs some instruction for the actuators which eventually turns into some change. Okay. So in the mind might be that the agent says, I want to go south. But again, the actuators, which are my legs, my whole body, might implement these things in a way that is not exactly south. Okay. So there is also this difference between what is actually the instruction coming from the agent and how it is actually implemented in practice. <coughs> which may vary, okay? So this is just to distinguish logical layers of this process. And uh, so there are different kinds of learning tasks which can be considered, and you might have heard uh, about them. So it's important to distinguish from the outset what's the difference between the three great categories, which of course, their, their boundaries are a bit blurred, but uh, they are very helpful in categorizing things. So you might have heard about unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning, which would be the subject of our discussion. So what, what's the difference between these three? So uh, anyone knows what unsupervised learning is about? Okay. Yeah, please pick up. Sorry, I gotta give you the mic. Basically, in supervised learning, you first uh, unsupervised. First. Uh, unsupervised. Okay, unsupervised learning. You just mm, you know let the machine learn by itself. Basically, I mean, you give the rule to the the, the rules to the machine, and basically you define 
like an, an opt uh, function to optimize, basically. Do you? I'm not sure. Okay. That's <laughs> exactly what unsupervised learning does. You you wanted to to. No, I was you, I was I, not I was, sure about was, supervised learning. <laughs> then, then go for supervised. <laughs> Well, su supervised learning, supervised, yeah. basically you first provide some examples to the machine, mm -hmm. you see what the outcome of the machine is, and based on the outcome, you, for example, I'm thinking about neural, artificial neural networks, you change the, weight, the weights between neurons until you, um, you know, reach, uh, I mean, the, until the machine is actually uh, capable to return the outcome that one wants. Okay, that was a bit complicated, but let's yes. let's try to to distill it a bit. So there are two there's two big categories. So unsupervised learning is a is what a, a machine can do uh, if it's offered examples data, and this data come with no particular information attached, and the machine has to discover whether in the data there is some correlation, for instance whether in this amount of data, actually, which might be in principle be very large, there actually is some small dimensional uh, description of the data which works. But this is something just like that works by feeding examples without any particular information from outside. The other extreme of this, which is supervised learning, is that every example that is given in the beginning comes with a label which says, this is an image of a dog. This is an image of a cat. And you give many, many examples of that. And then by some technique, including the ones that your colleague was talking about, the machine learns how to, for instance, classify things by perhaps reducing some error function. So this kind of learning techniques can be still incorporated in this description. So let's start with unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning means that you're giving to the machine images of, I don't know, dogs of all kinds without any label attached, and then the machine has to learn that there is some commonality between all these things. Of course, it's a very long and painful process, and you need a lot of data for this to converge. So unsupervised learning is a way of, is a very difficult task in general, okay? Unless the data are very structured, then you just, at first sight, you don't know because they are very complicated to look at, but they have some very precise structure in them, and then you will be able to extract this, this correlation between the data that you have. Uh, but unsupervised learning, basically, you can think about it as, a, as just this one-way process. <laughs> so data are coming in, the agent sees them and process them, and then basically the process is stopped. Right? Because it's just the one direction of flow. That data coming in and then the mind, the brain, the machine that sort of tries to mull it over and extract some information. But there's no returning to the environment and changing the things that the machine does according to the data we get. This kind of adaptive behavior typically is not a feature of unsupervised learning. Yes? AlphaGo Zero was totally the opposite of a, it, there was no supervision at all. Unsupervised. Totally unsupervised. Sorry, uh, what do you mean by that? It was not a clearly not a supervised and not an unsupervised in this way. It was a reinforcement learning, which is the third category I'm going to talk about, okay? Which stays in between. Uh, so the, the supervised case is when from the environment you get data plus a lot of additional information about the data, tags, labels. Okay. So there is really a teacher which is sending information, the agent sees the data, okay, and then classifies it and says, okay, this is one or the other, and then also tells you, okay, this was the right classification, it did the wrong one, and then it can improve on that in order to get, but the data are still there, that, that, that's what they are, you might think of incorporating the second part, which is once you've trained the algorithm, then you go over a new set of data and you see whether it's been able to classify correctly the new set of data, which would make perhaps one other loop, but then the process 
is arrested. Okay. So first thing, this kind of classical ways of learning do not require a continuous interaction of, with the environment. They are not made with that intent. They are basically one shot or two shot processes. That's the first thing. But there's one, another most important thing that is missing in this kind of approaches, which is it? What was the key distinctive feature of all the movies that you've seen yesterday? Pardon? Um, dynamics. dynamics, yeah, right, so that's correct, but adaptation. adaptation, yeah, but rewards, rewards yeah, but rewards are, are the manifestation of what? Pardon? Action on, Action on the environment, yes, that, that's correct. I mean, these machines want to do something, have a purpose, have a goal. That's the most important thing. There is an explicit goal. AlphaGo wants to win, right? The robots want to get to some place through the snow, open the door, and for God's sake, it does really want to open that door. Right? As much as the rat wants to get the pellet or avoid the electric shock. So there is an explicit notion of goal, of purpose, of objective, which in the other two forms of learning is not evident at all. Even though for some purposes, purpose you might say, okay, this, this algorithm wants to reduce the error, so the error is a goal. But why, why, what for? Once you've classified dogs and cats, what the hell are you gonna do with that? What's the purpose of that? Okay. So reinforcement learning is one of the paradigms, let's say, of learning. Again, the boundaries are blurred, okay? So don't take everything like just, I'm putting this thing in a, in a single case and that, that's it. But it's one paradigm which focuses on the fact that Agents have goals. These goals are somehow connected with the rewards, which at this stage don't appear yet, but we'll, we'll do that soon. And their actions are oriented in, in the direction of getting as much as possible of this objective. And they do so by repeatedly interacting with the environment. Okay, so these are two aspects which make reinforcement learning distinctive. There is a goal, this goal, the reaching, reaching of this goal is mediated by these rewards, which are a specific way of interacting with the environment, and there is a dynamical process which goes on, and it's a repeated interaction with the environment. So these things you have to keep, uh, to keep in mind. And it's a very powerful framework, because it allows to describe behaviors from simple organisms such as bacteria, you can try and formulate questions in this framework to, of course, uh, uh, mice and primates uh, uh, to machines. So it's, re it's really a very wide and general notion, and that's why we, we are here discussing this, this point. So uh, what makes reinforcement learning uh, peculiar in general is that this percept can actually be split into two components. So this percept actually will be a pair, which is made by rewards or reinforcement signals. That stands for the same thing. There are, of course, differences in concepts. And observations. So this distinction, bigger, okay. I'll try and do that. Is that slightly better? Thank you. So uh, both of these things are signals coming from the environment. Okay? So we just want to split it artificially because they play very different roles. So think again about the, ma the rat in the cage. 
So he was doing different observations. So the environment, the presence of the bar, okay? It could see eventually the presence of the pellet. These are all observations. And the reward comes from actually eating the pellets. Okay. So we're going to split these two things. Both of them are parts of the percepts, okay? Because the agent perceives the reward, say, ah, that, that's good. But also we want to split this into rewards. Why, why that? Because out of rewards, we are going to build our objective function. So this is what is called in the literature, literature a hedonistic agent. The goal of the agent is to maximize its pleasure. And its pleasure is measured in terms of rewards. Now, there's one thing which is very important and has to be clarified from the beginning, that the goal of an agent is not necessarily, not always, to maximize rewards in itself. What does that mean? So let's go back to the example, what are we doing here today? Hmm? So what is the reward that you're getting for sitting here, the immediate reward? Knowledge. Knowledge. Is it an immediate reward? The immediate signing the tent. That, that's that's better. That's the closer to the immediate re reward that you get is that I sign the attendance. I have just marked this thing. I'm I'm avoiding a punishment if you wish. Okay. This is the immediate thing. But are you here because you are because of that? Might be. <laughs> it's a legitimate behavior. Uh, but perhaps some of you, okay, uh, have some more, some sort of longer perspective. Let's say, okay, I'm here because I have to sign the paper, but also because in the longer run, this will be useful for me. Okay, that's a hope at least. Okay, and uh, so let alone why I am here. <laughs> that's an entirely different question. Uh, I don't even have to sign. Uh, uh, but no, that, that's important. The serious thing is that uh, rewards are short-term feedbacks. Okay. You take an action, you get a reward. You take an action, you get a reward. But that's not the goal, not necessarily. It's the goal just if your horizon, time horizon, okay. Now I'm speaking very loosely because all these things that I'm talking about will become symbols and formulas, okay. But it's better to get an uh, intuitive uh, understanding of what we're talking about. So it's very important the time horizon, okay? If, uh, if you knew that today at 1 p.m. you will be all awarded, I don't know, PhD degrees from Harvard free, for free, okay? This would set your horizon to a very short uh, time span, right? Because, you know, do I have to struggle for many days? It's something that will come, no, it will come just after the lecture, okay? So it's, it's very important what the horizon is. Are you doing things in the long term or are you doing things in the short term? Another more mundane example, okay? You have, suppose you have now in your pocket a certain sum of money, I don't know, $1,000. Okay. So there are many, many things you can do, okay? You can go and say, okay, I'm gonna rent a, a boat and have a party. Everybody's invited, yay, okay? Or you say, okay, I'm gonna keep it away or invest it into some uh, investment that will perhaps give me, I don't know, 3% after 10 years that I keep the money. Well, these are two very different streams, right? And depends on, they depend on, on your perception of what your time horizon is. Okay. So you're making a lot of assumptions about what you will be in 10 years if you put that into a savings account, right? <coughs> And you're also making a lot of assumptions if you just dissipate it in the course of a few hours. Yes, please. How does it affect the human instinct? Because I think the workout here is putting down. For example, trying to work. Yeah, yeah. The rewards in general, so yeah. We, 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 we tend, for simplicity, we tend to uh, conflate into this notion of rewards many things. This might 
could be as varied as the pellet for the rat, okay? You don't get any pellet here, okay? For more symbolic rewards and even for reinforcement signals which are at a very, very high level that we don't even perceive, okay? It could be, these rewards could be dopamine signals in the brain. It's a very abstract notion which tries to encompass all the variety of these things. And sometimes, of course, it's not rich enough to, to capture all these things. But we have to start from the simplest description ever. So, but that's, that's a good point. Um, okay, so this is another very, very important uh, uh, thing because once you accept the idea that you're not doing all your actions just for the immediate reward and you have some time horizon ahead of you, which almost all living beings do, except in particular conditions, uh, then there is another requirement that comes immediately. So why would you decide to put your money into savings account. Again, you, first of all, like we said, you have a time horizon. You have some expectancy of about how long you will live, okay? That's, a, that's the first and basic thing. But that's crude, but that's it, okay? The second thing is, is another one, is you think that there will be some things in the future that you're putting away money for something because you eventually would want to buy a car or a, or a house, or you may be putting them aside to, to travel somewhere. You have plans. So as long as there is a long-term goal which has to be achieved, the notion of planning immediately comes into the game. So a key important idea of this, all this learning process is that you have to predict the future somehow. So there is this implicit task of trying to optimize action while doing things in order to get some long-term goal which will require some sort of planning. How good your planning abilities will be, it depends on many factors and we will discuss all of them in great, great detail. But that's also important in the future. So there is this kind of idea of projecting into the future in order to forecast what will happen. And all algorithms, more, the most efficient ones, have very good ways of predicting what will happen. In some situations, you have so, your knowledge is so limited that you cannot really predict, and then you will have just to sort of proceed in a slower way in order to learn. But still, you can get there uh, to, to very good uh, uh, and efficient behavior nonetheless. Very good. Uh, so, questions? So let's start and put these things into uh, more firm ground. And the language that we will be using um, is actually simplified for the task of highlighting the conceptual things rather than the technical aspects. So uh, we will be dealing with, with a very simple description, for instance, in which time goes by, goes on by, by ticks, okay? So we'll be discussing all our models and processes and ideas where time just advances by integer steps. This is a simplification, of course, time flows continuously for all purposes, for our, all, all of our perception and all machine perception that can have. But this makes the description simpler from the mathematical viewpoint, so we will stick to that. Just to know in advance that it's possible to go to the continuous time limits with many other interesting issues that get come about, but we will not have time, neither time nor the, uh, the techniques to, to deal with. For, for algorithms, I mean, we, we only deal with time, right? mm. I mean, we Yes, that depends on, on how short your time to react is, right? Okay, well, if you, I mean, if you're not, uh, disturbed by this, that's fine. That was exactly the purpose. So if nobody is disturbed by the fact that we go on with discrete times, we will do that, <laughs> okay? So there is an index of time which goes on by steps. So time will be zero, one, etc. So these are the times at which, actually what, what are these times? These times are the times over which an interaction with the environment and a subsequent action is taken, okay? So it's a, it's the clock over which these things happen, or might happen. The system might stay there for a long while before taking any action. 
because taking no action is an action. Okay. So this is an intrinsic time which is which is ticking, the clock which is ticking. And at every time, what, what is happening in in our system? So, like I said, the percept, which is usually uh, well, it might be called like this, small et. This is the percept. <coughs> This is the signal that comes from the environment to the agent at time t, and it usually has, is a couple, rt and yt. So this is the reward or reinforcement signal, and this is the observation. So in general, these quantities might be discrete or real. The reward in our setting is a one-dimensional signal, so it's just a real number. So, so we do not encompass in our treatment, and basically 99.9% of the literature does not consider this, there is no vectorial structure in the reward, okay? So one consequence of this is that punishments are viewed as negative rewards, like we discussed yesterday, but there are no nuances in reward. Okay, so just like you could put everything onto a single line. So a pellet which is slightly larger than another is basically has to be compared on the same uh, units as a pellet which is smaller but better at taste. Okay, all these details are conflated into a single measure for learning. Yep. And the question short term and long term? It will come. Just a second. This is the immediate feedback from the environment at every time. Observation, again, larger. Okay. I have to make an effort. Sorry. Yeah, this is very small. I, I agree. Is that one uh, the issue? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, No, it's a, it's a simplifying assumption, like I said, uh, which uh, is customarily taken. Clearly does not cover all situations. But if we want to understand the basic concepts of how this reinforcement learning technique works, it, there is already enough richness in this scalar case to cover basically uh, all of the concepts that, that we'll be discussing. So it's it's a, it's an assumption, it's a limitation, but it's not very restricting in in concept. What is the use of this quantity? Is it the entire instrument, or is it the amount of information? No, 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 no. The rewards is is given in its own units, okay, which you can normalize to some level to some some reference values, uh, but it has its own units, which might be I don't know. Sugar content of the pellet or whatever, okay? Uh, we we wouldn't won't be focusing much on on on, on this aspect, but so we will consider this abstract. Then we won't care much about the dimensions. Uh, but this could be anything, okay? Observations is, is instead is a, is a large is a vectorial thing, okay? Which might be very large. For 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 a robot might be the image that the camera is capturing at, a, at any given step, plus all other information given by radars, plus might be a very, very high dimensional vector. And we are fine with that, okay? So there's much, much more scope for description of the other world here. It's not, this is not just a single number or something. Might be very simple in some specific examples that we will discuss for the sake of learning ourselves how this thing works, but in general this is a very, a very large object. And then the action is also labeled by some symbol A, 
sub t. And uh, again, this could be a continuous action or a discrete action. So for chess board games, it, it's, it's taken from a subset of actions that you can take it, which is a finite set. So from every configuration of the board, there is a finite set of actions that you can make that are allowed. But for some other tasks, for instance, for the movement of a robot, the action might be turned by 27 degrees or 27.5 or 27.6.666, okay? There might be a continuum of actions, which we're not consider. Again, we will consider situations for simplicity where actions are discrete, just, just for simplicity. But again, the system allows for such extensions into continuum uh, uh, spaces of actions. And then there is another quantity, which is the state of the environment. And it's typically written as S sub T. And this again is a huge dimensional object. So for Go, for instance, it's the configuration of the pieces on the chessboard. For the robot is whatever is outside, at least within the room, for instance. For the mouse is the cage and whatever it contains. Okay. So this is really the, the real thing, the thing that you would observe with perfect knowledge of your environment. So it's important to distinguish in general that the observation is not in general the state of the environment, even though sometimes it could be in simplified examples. But in general, the observation is just a subset of the things that you can observe in the environment. Okay? This, for physicists, should be sort of an obvious notion. You, you don't measure everything in the world in order to make any process, right? You, you select some particular observables. So these are the observables. This is the system. And in typically, the number of observables that you focus on are, is, is much smaller in number than the number of degrees of freedom of your system, right? So this is the full state of the environment. Are these definitions clear? Any question about them? Okay. Uh, so, then we, we move and, and describe uh, the first general setting, which is really very wide and encompasses all of the future distinctions that we will make, so that it goes under the name of the full reinforcement learning problem. We will require a little bit of additional definitions that we want to introduce. And this will formalize the notion of our, our agent experiencing interaction with the environment, collecting information about it, making actions, and so on and so forth. So in order to do that, we, we will have to introduce first one thing that is the history What is the history? Well, the history, and typically this is labeled as, uh, with an H less than T, okay? So this means that it's covering everything that happened before that time T at which decision will be made. Uh, and this is just a sequence made of all the previous things that happened to the agent and that the agent is aware of. So, for instance, the first action that the agent took. I'm starting with, I'm starting this way, okay? I could have started this way either, doesn't matter. So I'm starting here, at time t equals one, the agent makes some action. As a result of this action, 
the environment will respond and say, oh, the agent did that. For instance, the mouse pressed the bar. And then the agent reacts and sends out information to the mice, to the rat, telling, you will get the reward. So this will be plus one reward, for instance. And you will observe what, you, what you've been doing. You will see that fall into the box, observation. Okay. And the agent records this. So it, get, it has gotten a reward, and it made an observation. And then the thing cycles again. There will be a new action with a new reward and a new observation as a feedback from the environment, and so on and so forth, up to time t minus 1. Action t minus 1, reward t minus 1, observation t minus 1. So that's the previous history. Now, what the agent is doing now is that given this stream of events that occurred, all these observations and actions that he took and rewards that he got, it has to decide what to do next. And what to do next is what goes under the name of a policy. What is a policy? A policy is how actions are implemented. And in general, a policy is a probability distribution over all possible actions. So suppose your agent has, has 10 possible actions to do. There will be a probability distribution over these actions. Some of them, the agent will deem to be more probable, and others less probable. Because typically, we act like this, right? So we have to decide between different things. If the decision is difficult, we don't just say, OK, I'll I got that, that. Well, perhaps I should do that. This is, could be better, but yeah, there's a chance that other actions would be equally good or better, etc. So this allows for the for the for the possibility of describing uh, policies or decision making, which is as, as a certain random component. So this policy is a probability distribution. So it's a probability, say at time t. Okay, this is a sort of. Uh, uh, redundant notation of taking one action A given the history. Okay. So this is what where the agent makes decisions. It has a certain history, so it looks at the string of numbers, and then according to this function, picks one action of the many that it can do. So this is one generic A among all the possible actions that can be taken. And it picks it according to a probability distribution, which is pi t. This includes also deterministic strategies. That is, if this pi t is 1 for one specific action and 0 for all others, then it's deterministic. Otherwise, it's random. The machine throws a random number, and according to the probability of this by t picks that action. Clear? So this is the policy. As a result, the new action, at, will be picked from this probability distribution, pi t, condition on the previous history. Okay. That's what I mean. It's, I'm just rephrasing the statement. I will pick action at at time t according to that probability distribution. So this is a description of how the agent perceives the environment and collects information about the environment. In this case, which is also a particular case, there is no processing of this history. So in principle, the agent could have an infinitely long record of memory behind. Of course, it's always possible to extend this into the case where there is some forgetfulness of the agent, so parts of the history will be erased. We will discuss this if we have time also. But in general, let's think that this agent has no memory limits and can store all this uh, previous uh, experience into this string and then pick one decision. The question is again, why does it want to do that? So what's the goal of this? 
And then reinforcement learning theory proposes one specific definition, well, there are many of them, but this is the most common one, of what is the agent's goal. So the goal is maximize the following object. I'm writing this and then I'm explaining what that is. So this stands for expected value because all these quantities are random in general. Rewards might be random, observations are random variables, so everything is stochastic in general here, okay? So this is the expectation value of the sum from, say, uh, now going from one to infinity, let me pick the index right for the first time, no, let's say uh, two, see, so tau going from one to infinity or zero to infinity, gamma t plus two, also three words. Okay, so this is the, the objective function. There might be other definitions, okay? So this is one, this is one possible. What is this? So this we know what that is. It's the reward that you get in the future. So you are sitting here at time t, all these things are happening later in the future. And you want to maximize this kind of weighted sum of future rewards. Up to very far in the future. The thing that we are, yeah? These are the weights. So weighted sum, when I say weighted sum, I'm meaning that these are the future rewards and these are the weights. In this sense. This weight? Yeah, I'm about to tell you. <laughs> so this is, this gamma factor is called the discount factor. And it's one way of implementing the notion of time horizon that we've been discussing earlier. So this gamma is actually a number. Which typically goes between zero and one. Zero can always be included one. It depends on particular properties of the process, okay? Might be strictly less than one or equal to one depending on what you what kind of task, and we will see something. So this discount factor is implementing this notion of time horizon in one, in one simple way, which will be the one that we adopt because it's simple. In order to understand how it works, think about the simplest case, gamma equals zero. If gamma equals zero, all the terms of this sum in the future will vanish, except the first one. Sorry, this was gamma tau, sorry, 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 sorry. Except the first one, when tau is equal to zero. Okay. So when gamma is zero, it's only the next reward that matters. And this is the behavior of your fellow, no, sorry, I'm, I'm just kidding, <laughs> which only cares about optimizing the immediate reward. It's also called the greedy behavior. You just look one step ahead in the future and you say, What's there around that I can grasp? I will do that. Without caring for, for the consequences. Okay, so it's a very myopic or short-sighted behavior. So as, as you go with gamma tending to zero, you go towards myopic behavior. You don't look very far in the future. You don't care. On the other way around, when gamma tends to one, this sum takes a very long time before being cut off 
by these exponential factors. So you're looking very much into the future. And events that happen after 100 steps are equally as important as events that happen at the immediate step ahead. Okay. So in that case, when gamma tends to 1, you will require to act wisely and say, OK, I missed the lecture, immediate reward. But in the end, will I suffer more? Yes, in two weeks' time when the exam is, is there. Okay. So this is just one way of implementing this. And it's, it's appealing theoretically because you can think of this as in a very simple way. So you can interpret this gamma as the probability that the agent will die okay, <coughs> after each step. Yes? You can, uh, you can extend this in all possible directions. See? So these discount factors might be any function of time that you wish. And people have explored this. And in the psychology literature, actually, you can see that this is not a very good way of representing how human decisions are actually taken. Okay? Uh, so this is appealing for two reasons, this description. So the general consideration is that with that description, we will be able to understand a lot of things. And this is actually what is done in, in most algorithms. So that, that's the sort of basic uh, uh, motivation. Then there is one motivation which is more uh, historical. These discount factors come from economics. Okay. When, whereas all, when all this decision, so suppose that there was now our money and then all these things is the stock market and, uh, okay, it's, it's a, it's a legitimate description of what's happening in the financial markets, this one, okay? And then this gamma would be essentially the rate at which your money, if you keep it in your pocket, will increase value. So that if you don't keep it in your money, it will lose that amount, okay? So this discounting factor comes from economic considerations, if you get an idea. There is another appealing, which now, now it's appealing for physicists, and, and this was the one I was, I was talking about before. You could think this gamma, of this gamma as the probability of dying at every step. In a process that you make a step, then with probability gamma, sorry, with probability one minus gamma you die, and probability gamma you survive. So it's a survival probability. And then after tau step, we, we, there will be a probability of survival, which is gamma to the tau. So this is an agent which at every time could be just pulled out of this game by fate. And that's wh why you think of this thing as, as an horizon, effective horizon. Because if you expect that you will live 100 years, then you will put this object to be one over one minus gamma would be 100 years in your, your time steps. Okay? So this should be intuitive. It's just like a, a radioactive process taking, a geometric process taking steps over discrete times and, uh, and it tends. What's the definition for um, punishment? Like I said, punishment here is just negative rewards. So when these rewards have a, a negative value, they will be interpreted as punishments. And when they're positive, they will be interpreted as uh, encouragements. So like I said, this low dimensionality of the reward is, is also um, um, what do I want to say? Um, yeah, it, it's problematic in the sense that it doesn't reflect all the complexity of the experiences that we get from the viewpoint of the rewards that we have. But it's also very interesting because this system will be able to, our algorithms, the algorithms that we'll describe, will be able to act very well and even optimally in some specific cases on the basis of, very, of a very partial feedback. Because at every step, the, the observations are information about the state of the system, okay? Which are, of course, helpful. And you, you as an agent, you, you will want to rely on that. Even though you could even have a, an agent which does make no observation. And the only thing that it perceives is rewards. 
And rewards are, of course, a very unfaithful description of the environment because they are not able to capture everything. So suppose you make your mice, your mouse or your rat totally blind and it cannot sense anything, but still when it, it can only feel that to a certain action follows a reward. That's the only thing that it can feel. And he will be able to learn nonetheless, even on the basis of a very, very unstructured reward as a signal. So that's why it's also important to keep this reward signal very low dimensional, because it shows you that actually in order to improve you, the behavior of your algorithm, you will just need essentially feedback from rewards only. That will be sufficient. Okay? Fine. Um, so before moving, uh, yeah. Gamma is given. In this process, in this, so some things will be given, some others not, but gamma is given here, okay? It's not something that has to be learned. What is given and what has to be learned will be clear in a second when we move on, okay? But at this stage, the crucial thing is that what has to be learned is this policy, is the choice of action that maximizes this. So this maximization is a maximization over the policies. That's the key thing. We want to find decision-making rules that map histories into actions in such a way that our future return, this thing is called the return, which is different from the reward, like we said, unless gamma is equal to zero, in which case they coincide. We want to maximize this long-term return. Is that clear what the goal of the thing is? I assume it is. Uh, fine. So, as physicists, uh, you should be sort of, all these things should sort of sound familiar to you to some extent. Does, does this ring a bell for any of you about anything that you might have encountered during your studies? So, sorry, just, just don't overlap, otherwise I'll be your, speak up. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's related. But I, I was thinking about something more, more basic that you might have encountered. The Mutanian system uh, is interaction with the heat gas and the anchor of the energy is being sent in much more constantly and minimize the energy. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a variation of principle, which is common to the idea of maximizing something. A cell, yeah, that that comes from biology, so it's it's fully in it. But something for from physics. Oh, it's more. It's too complicated. Something simpler. I'm looking for something very very simple. Just like I said, you're looking for difficult things. Yes, yes, yes. The thermostat in the room. Your, the thermostat, which is keeping the temperature, I hope, at a certain fixed level, is a device like this. It's a problem, a feedback control. There's something which has existed in engineering since, I don't know, 100 years. Okay? And in physics, that's the same. You have a dynamical system, and you have some parameters that you can adjust in order to do, make your system do what you want. That's how machines work, right? You have to find the right way to control your system in order to make it do something. So this is one instance of a feedback controller. Just of course, it's more general, it's uh, more interesting, but the roots of all the things that we're discussing are in the realm of optimal control theory. In particular, this will be stochastic optimal control theory. 
And then you might have different languages depending if your system lives in continuum space as it does or in a, on a discrete uh, state set of states or actions, etc. But if you abstract from this, that's exactly the same, the same problem. Okay. Very good. Um, so now we move to the to another uh, somewhat descriptive part. So uh, I will erase this part of the blackboard, mm. or perhaps I will erase that part. So this is another important classification that, that we have to make at the beginning that it will be helpful to guide us into the different uh, things that uh, can be done. Uh, so this is this full reinforcement learning problem is actually is, is extremely complex. So suffice it to say that to date there is no no result, no mathematical result available about the properties of any specific heuristic policy that you might think of implementing in this case. So this is really terra incognita for mathematicians for the, this full reinforcement learning problem. But there are versions of that simplified in many aspects for which we have, on the contrary, many results and very interesting and tell us a lot about the limits of these learning processes and uh, the benefits of being able to predict or to plan, etc. Okay. So in order to navigate into this complicated space of many things, I find it helpful uh, to try to locate into some abstract two-dimensional plane all the kind of uh, versions of reinforcement learning that that have been around in the in the last period. This is not exhaustive, okay? Like any two-dimensional map of a very complicated multi-dimensional problem, but it's something that I think it's helpful in organizing your thought. So, and also we, this will provide us a sort of a path through the lectures. We will starting from one point and then moving to other points, etc. Uh, so, like we said, a key step in being able to optimize your performance, optimize your return, and making good decisions is the ability somehow to look into the future, okay? Now again, as physicists, and so there are two key ingredients that determine your ability of predicting. And I want this to come out from you. Two ingredients. You have to know two things to be able to predict the future. You are physicists, okay? So don't think complicated stuff. No, no, one, one, at, a one, at, one at a time, not, not everybody together. Okay, so raise your hands and now. The present. The present, that, that's a very good answer. Let's elaborate a little bit on that. What does that mean, the present? Initial conditions, okay. And why are we limited in specifying the initial conditions? No, you're messing it up. No. The initial conditions of a dynamical system. Uh, I mean, I'm talking classical Newtonian mechanics. The initial conditions of the system are my particle is at position x with the velocity v. Is that a legitimate initial condition for the problem? It depends. Phase space of one particle, <laughs> like I said. <laughs> okay, don't, don't overcomplicate. Okay. The phase space of one particle, is it fully specified by position and velocity? Good, okay. Then is it fully specified independently of the potential or all the forces that are acting on the system, right? So one thing is the initial condition, another thing is the lows. Good, okay. And this is already actually the answer of the thing. In order to predict efficiently, you have to be precise in the determination of your initial condition. And you have to have good knowledge of what the laws of your systems are. Okay? So if you know 
initial position and velocity of your particle. And you know what is the potential forces, what is the non-conservative forces, what all these things are, and you know that the laws, the Newton laws hold, then you will be able to predict. Sometimes for a very short lapse of time, if your system is not integral, etc. But you will be able to look a little bit into the future, at least. But as soon as your ability to characterize your initial state or your ability to know what the laws of nature that regulate the motion of this particle are, then you, your performance in prediction will degrade. Okay? So how does atmospheric prediction work? Combining the two. Right? So there's an increasing demand in getting real-time data and then increasing demand in having more and more accurate computational models. If you lose one of these two legs, you just, just fall to the ground. You might have a very, very accurate snapshot of the, of the actual maps of temperature, temperature and pressure, etc. But if you don't have any computational tool and equations that describe it this faithfully, this will predict nonsense. And the other way around, if you have a perfect model of what happens in uh, the atmosphere, but you, you're not fed with actual initial conditions, well, yeah, we, will be, we will be predicting something, but not what will happen here or tomorrow. Okay? So let's try and put these things on, on this axis, because this applies for our problem as well. So there will be one thing which is Let's, ca let's call it more generally uh, the precision with which we measure the environment is something related to this step, right? Is how we convert, how the information about the state of the environment is converted into an actual observation. So let's get back again to the example of the particle. A single particle, it lives in position and momentum space, right? Now suppose you can observe only position. You will not be able to control this particle as efficiently as you would do if you knew position and momentum. Okay? And this is a limitation because your subset of observation is not the full state space. And again, this is a real problem because in most applications of artificial intelligence and reinforcement learning, you don't observe the full state space. We don't observe the full set of possible configurations of the of Go. We don't observe the, the whole world around us. We just get a subset of observables. Okay. So this axis, let's call it information about the environment. Again, it's, it's very qualitative. Huh? The more you go up this axis, the more you are close to knowing the real state of the environment. This is the true state, which is typically hidden to us. So if you go up on the, this axis, you will have access to the real state, which is a big, big thing already. And on this axis, we will put our knowledge of the environment, let's say. Here I mean knowledge of the law, of the laws that regulate the environment. Do you, do you see the sense in, in making this category, sort of categorization, okay? So, here, up here, wow, that's a beautiful place to live, where you have perfect knowledge of what the future will preserve, will, will, uh, uh, will reserve you. And if you combine this with the perfect information of what, say, your current state, then you will be able to act optimally. So this is a situation where you think about the stock market, where you know in advance what will be the consequences of 
all your actions, and you know exactly the situation of the full market. And then you are here, and then it's just a matter of computing. So the decision-making problem in this area actually becomes a problem where you don't have anything. You, you, there's nothing to learn. It's just about computing. So could, could you please speak up? Well, that, that's a situation in which you, you're sort of not so very far away on the right on this axis, right? Because your model is trying to, is not. Yeah, that's the knowledge of the dy full dynamics of the system. That, that's just like God came and told you, if you had this certain set of values of the stocks in 10 days from now, this will be like this. You just have to compute. You do the job of computing, of turning the crank, but the laws are given. Sure. Is that clear? Uh, so up here, actually, it's the realm of a very specific subset of problems, which go under the name of uh, Markov decision processes. They live up here. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the limit in that upper right corner. Then we will show, and that's the first thing that we will do, that in that case, everything boils down to computing things, to computing things. There will be algorithms. We just compute the optimal behavior without having to learn. You don't have to learn. It's just because you know how to predict with infinite precision the future. And this will be the starting point, because lessons that we learn from here will be put to use to navigate this part of the spectrum of possibilities. At the opposite end of this, this is where the full reinforcement learning problem stays. The one that, we, that I aptly erased. Okay. Here you just rely on the previous history. That's all you have. Things that have already happened, and you have to base your decisions on that. No attempt whatsoever at looking into the future. And observations might be very, very rough. You will be able to learn. That's what you're saying. Yeah, sure, sure. Otherwise, that would be hopeless. You can, you can accumulate information and then use that for your purpose. That, that's the whole thing. Of course, everything will be much slower. OK? Um, Not really, in the sense that in this setup, there will always be experiences that you make and some others that you don't. Here, you're already told of what kind of experiences are possible or aren't, et cetera. You're, you're told everything, OK? And here, nonetheless, even if you have made, so suppose that your sequence of observations is a sequence of ones, OK? Uh, at any time, you, you're not really sure whether there will be pop out a zero sometime, right? So you have to account for that possibility as well. Uh, here is that you're told that this is one. And again, the drift in this direction is whether you don't know whether a zero will pop out, but it can pop out also an emoji or whatever. <laughs> and here you're told, OK, it can be zeros or ones. Or it can be any integer numbers, and th that, that's the way I see you're moving along this line. 
There's a, there's a notion of quality of the information that you're, you get. Uh, so then there are, these are two other corners, which are also super interesting. Uh, so let's start with this one here, down here. This is a situation in which you have knowledge of the laws of physics, but imperfect measurements. Uh, well, okay, that's one example, but I'm not very much willing on going into that. I will keep it to classic, classical. So it's just, it's just a very simple example, right? Suppose you have, uh, uh, I don't know, everybody knows what, uh, what is a, 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 an optical trap. Yeah, so it's, it's an optical device which you can use to manipulate small particles, right? So this is a small particle which is just fluctuating in, uh, in water medium and then you have this laser and you can move the particle around. And then you, you have to control this particle and say I want to move this particle from A to B. That's my goal, the goal of my task. And uh, I want to do this, uh, and I have to observe where the particle is, because I, if the particle is in another place, I, I, I need to tune my, the position of my trap in order not to lose it. And now the observation that you can make of that particle depends on the quality of your optics, right? If you have a, a PhD looking like this and say, oh, the particle is there, it's very low quality, all right? If you have a super fast microscope, it's very high but there will be also latency time and all kinds of problems, right? So there's a continuum of quality of the observation that you get. There is a continuum of differences between what the position of the particle is, which is just one part of its phase space, and the actual observation that you get. But nonetheless, you want to control. And you know that there are the low, what are the laws of motion of that. But you just don't know something about it, or you know it with, a cert, with some uncertainty. But still, you want to control. That's perfectly legitimate task, and that's actually what happens in practice all the time. So what is happening here is that you want to control what is called a hidden Markov process. So there is some underlying Markov process, Newton's law. Newton's law, our Markov process, deterministic one. It's there, but the actual states of your system are hidden to you. You just get some observation out of it. So this part here goes under the name of, these are two names which should be self-explanatory. One is partially observable Markov decision process, or POMDP. These also are actually controlled hidden Markov models. But they are not, not known under this name, but that's what they are. There is a Markov process underlying which we want to control. We want to make it do things, but it's hidden to us. Of course, there's, a, again, a, a way of going continuously from one thing to the other depending on how good your observations are. If your observation is perfect, then you jump immediately onto that. And you know the laws of nature, okay? Now there's another way of moving in, the, in this diagram, which is in this direction, in which your knowledge of the environment decreases, so you have less and less power of predicting, but you're very good at knowing where you are. So you get a very good information about the state of the environment. In the limit, it's perfect. You know in which state you are. You know you get exactly position and momentum for your particle, but you don't know what the Newton's law. Okay. Sort of the the lazy experimentalist uh, corner. Okay, you get super super perfect uh, observation, but no idea how to use it. Okay. Uh, you can do a lot in that corner as well by very different techniques because in this case you don't have what is called, so the way of talking in, in uh, reinforcement learning literature of these laws of nature, etc., Newton's law is actually what is called as a model of the environment. It's a model of how the environment will evolve according to the actions that are taken and the state in which it was. Okay. 
So in this corner, this is the corner where uh, most of the initial theory of reinforcement learning was developed. And it's a corner where we will explore techniques and, and I will call it just model free RL. In this case, it's with perfect observation, whereas down here it's imperfect, imperfect observation. It's out of the, the, there's little dynamics in the, in the supervised learning case, right? So that's the first comment I made. So this is intrinsic to something where you have to look into the future and you want to optimize about, about something. So we will be spending time here tomorrow, the day after tomorrow here, and then here. And then we will try sort of a wrap up with a, with a general recipe for working anywhere here around, which is actually where our real algorithms work. Okay, so that's sort of a path, abstract path that we'll be working in the next uh, in the next lectures. Good. It's not a good idea to start with this because this will require a little bit of. Uh, 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 technical work, so it's better to defer this to tomorrow. So we'll spend, uh, but we still have so 10 to 15 minutes, by giving you uh, some examples of uh, uh, this kind of uh, problems, okay, and, uh, which will be a little bit of our uh, uh, workhorses for the rest of the course. So on these examples, we will try and do simple calculations and see this algorithm at work in cases where you can actually uh, work them out basically on the blackboard, okay? Uh, so this, this very simple examples are, uh, are easily listed uh, here. <clears throat> so the exercise here would be to uh, identify all the things that, all the subjects and, and ideas that I've been discussing into this particular task, okay? So, so the first class of uh, um, of problems that that will be recurring it, it's it's actually a very large class of decision processes which are by no means trivial, but whose uh, conceptual structure as a Markov process is very simple. Okay. So you had the tutorial yesterday about Markov processes, uh, the other ones are uh, already at a good stage. So when you define a Markov process, what, what do you mean? What's the basic ingredient of having a, for a Markov process? Transition matrix, transition between what and what? Okay. Ah, okay. First states, then transition between states, okay? And what's the simplest Markov process then? Sorry? Random walk. My guys, you're, you're so overcomplicated. <laughs> Markov chains, yeah, we're talking about Markov chains. What's the simplest Markov chain? How many states does it have? Two. Oh, yeah, of course, because when you learn to, to, to count, you say, oh, two, three, four, five. <laughs> What's the simplest Markov chain? Yeah, one. one state. One state. Okay, there is one state. Okay, and then the transition matrix is between what and what? The state into itself, right? But now let's suppose you could, you could go there by different channels, different choices, different actions. Very simple example, there's just one state, then you can take action zero, or you can take action one. 
So this is one way of drawing diagrams that uh, are that is very useful in the context of Markov decision process. So you are expected to get familiar with that. Okay. So this is the state. In a more general problem, there will be many of these balls around connected with many transitions, and that will be the Markov chain that you have in mind. But this is already something, right? So there's an action. And then, of course, the outcome of this action has to be that you get back, right? That's for sure. But again, as a combination of the initial state and the action, you might get there to, through different paths as well. Okay. So what's happening here is I'm in my state. This will be forever in that state, so let's forget about it. I take action one. Then the outcome of my, of my action could be one of these two arrows with some probability. So let's say with probability P, I go onto this branch and I get a reward plus one. So this is the reward. Now with probability one minus P, I get onto this branch and I get a reward minus one. On this other action, okay, so let's add another label for symmetry. Let's say P1 here, and then we do the same here. There's a, pro with probability P, P2, I go back with a reward plus one, and with probability one minus P2, I go back with a reward minus one. Yes. So this is a customary way of drawing these diagrams. And you can imagine that you can have many of them. And we will draw another one which is more complicated in a, in a second. Okay. So these are the states, just one state. This is a Markov chain. One state. How many transition probabilities? Many, depending on the action. Your action, my action space is these boxes, okay? So for every state, there is a set of allowed actions, which here are zero or one, which I can take. And if I take one of these action, then something will occur, okay? So environment, here there is no measurement, whatever, no observation, because there's one, just one state. Every observation, there can be no error here, okay? So this is just wiping off the the problem of observation. You just know that there is just one state. You will take one action, and then the outcome of your action will be random. Sometimes it sends you over one path, sometimes on the other, with a given probability. And depending on what happens, you will get a positive reward or a negative reward. You will be, it's just like, if the mice, if the mice takes this and pulls the lever, then I don't know, 95% of the time it gets the pellet and 95% of the time it gets a shock. The five, sorry, 5%, five of course. There was a question up there? No, we're just relaxing. I, think. <laughs> I thought there was a, someone raising the hand. Um, and, and this occurs on the other hand with another probability. So what is the policy here? Pardon? To go only for reward. To go only for? Sorry, I didn't get what you said. Yeah, that's the goal. The goal is to maximize the, the benefit, which we didn't define yet, but it will be the discounted sum of all the rewards that you get, as, as usual. The policy here is what probability should I give to these two actions? 
So there will be a probability pi of taking action one and a probability pi of taking action two. Uh, sorry, zero. And these two must sum up to one because we have to go somewhere. One half is one policy. Is it the best policy? Okay, who is, who is uh, d did you understand the suggestion? So the suggestion is the best policy is to act proportionally to what the rewards are. Is that right? No, no is that right? W sorry, is that right? Am I, am I correct in interpreting what you're saying? Yes, in, in the Good. The probability okay, proportional to the probability of getting the reward, okay? Yeah. This is something which exists in the literature. So now the, the second, is that right? Is, is this, is, does everybody agree with that this is the best strategy? It depends on your horizon time. It depends on your horizon time, okay? This is one thing. Yeah. Uh, I think that we have to assign all the probability to the chances of higher uh, probability than one. Yeah. 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 We have to assign all the probability, so this will be a deterministic policy in, op in, op in opposition to the one that's defined earlier, which is random, to which branch? The pro okay, the one with the biggest P. Yeah. If P1 is larger than that, you will go for this and vice versa. Okay, fine. Any other suggestion? So who votes for the sort of proportional strategy? Okay, who votes for the all on one strategy. <laughs> Good. That's what we'll do tomorrow. Discuss, think, come to a consensus. <laughs>